everyone. This is the Limit Configuration Horror Podcast. I am Greg Knox, as always, and I'm joined by someone who's hot, spicy, and tastes great. Our isn't body count girl, Rhea Fend. Hello, Greg. Where the hell did you get that introduction from? Um, thank you, anyway. So here I am, composed and northern as ever. And did you know that this week, Mancunian accents have been voted the sexiest accent in the country? Oh, there you go. Who can possibly disagree with that? Well, um, apparently it was polled and rated by a website called Love in Manchester, which I'm sure is entirely neutral. Oh, yeah, definitely. That's like a, the Sutton Guardian had this uh, article in the newspaper once saying that women in Sutton were voted the most attractive women in the whole of England. It's like, well, of course you're going to say that. It's the Sutton Guardian. So, yeah, I'm sure <laughs> there was no bias in there whatsoever. where did my spicy intro come from pray tell (laughs) well uh it's actually a wrestling intro so there's a wrestling character called curry man and um he gets introduced as he's hot he's spicy and he tastes great curry man okay fair enough i'll take it (laughs) (laughs) so on the show today as we discussed on the previous show um we are discussing some very, very controversial films. So just to get this out of the way as soon as possible, Rhea, because these are the video nasties, so these are the films listed uh, under Section 2 of the Obscene Publications Act 1959, and Rhea has our usual warning. I do, because we're getting down to the gritty, very gritty films in the video nasties. So here is the warning. Warning, the following broadcast may contain spoilers, extreme language, sexual violence and topics considered graphic or adult, not for those of a sensitive disposition. So uh, the theme of our show today is Rape Revenge, which is a very, very controversial uh, subgenre of exploitation and horror. And the first thing we're going to cover today is Last House on the Left, which is directed, of course, by Wes Craven. Um, if you're listening to the show, you probably like at least one Wes Craven film, be it Nightmare on Elm Street or Scream, or even something like The Hills Have Eyes, which I don't really like that much. But, you know, hey, a lot of people do. And this film, which is his first film and probably his most controversial film even to this day. Um, so um, Last House on the Left is... As anyone who knows anything about the film will know, it's a loose reworking of the story of Ingmar Bergman's The Virgin Spring, which came out in 1960. And Bergman is one of my favourite directors of all time. He's amazing. I love Bergman so much. And essentially, Last House on the Left is pretty much the same story as The Virgin Spring, although, be it a lot cheaper a lot sleazier, a lot more violent. Um, yeah, Bergman didn't quite make it as, as violent as this. He certainly didn't have any uh, comedy cop characters in his film. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, no definitely well, not. Um, I love Wes Craven. And I think he's, you know, he's a, he's a master, he's a genius in his field. Um, but I, I actually realised when I watched this today that this is the first time I've ever seen Last House on the Left. Oh, okay. So... Yeah, I'd seen it a couple of times before just because it's like one of those films that you're told you kind of have to watch because it's very, very important, which it is. Um, Although it's quite interesting because not only did it start Wes Craven's career, it also started Sean S. Cunningham's career, who obviously he directed Friday the 13th. And very weirdly, Steve Miner, who not only directed Friday the 13th Part 2 and 3, but also directed House, not the TV show. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Not the TV show. <laughs> no. So, uh, Rhea, tell us about the synopsis of Last House on the Left. Okay, so Last House on the Left is a 1972 film, um, and it's roughly about two teenage girls are going to a rock concert for one of their birthdays, and they try and score some some weed, some marijuana, and they're then kidnapped and brutalised by a gang of psychotic convicts. Yeah, yeah, basically it's true. Now, one of the things that I quite like about the film is the title. Now, this had several alternative titles, as a lot of these video nasties do. So um, one of which was Krug and Company, and it was Grim Company, Sex Crime of the Century, which is like, hmm, okay, that sounds like a completely different film altogether. The Men's Room, 
I'm like, uh, okay, not sure about that. And Night of Vengeance, which is quite a generic sort of title. But yeah, Last House on the Left, it's very, very evocative, even though it's not really a Last House on the Left because it's not really on a street. The house that a lot of this film takes place in is actually very isolated. Um, so it's not even sort of correct to the film itself, but oh well, <laughs> it's still great nonetheless. Very catchy title. I also like the fact that on the posters... Um, at the time they had um, because it was so controversial they had warnings on it so it says to avoid fainting um, keep repeating it's only a movie it's only a movie it's only a movie yeah and it had that in the uh, the trailer as well to avoid fainting please repeat it's only a movie only a movie yeah so (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah. okay (laughs) the trailers for these kind of films are all hilarious Uh, um, because they really 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 spice them up don't they spicy seems to be the word of the day (laughs) yes oh absolutely definitely uh very very appropriate um so so as i said it takes the same story as the virgin spring now of the two i gotta be honest i do prefer the virgin spring to this because the virgin spring has a lot more going on under the surface although if you know anything about this film it also has a lot going under the surface although obviously not quite as much as bergman's film did um, because this is a film which typically used in the argument that violence begets violence um so we what are your thoughts on this but violence begets violence. Yeah, so essentially, so, you know, so if you, uh, well, how do I put this? So basically you've got this group of criminals and they perform these various sort of violent deeds throughout the film and you've got the parents of Mary, who's one of the girls, and they are sort of these well-to-do kind of middle-class kind of citizens. So he is a doctor, which in all versions of this film, as we will discuss he is always a doctor and he is a weedy guy which he is supposed to be um, because this film has been remade and we're going to discuss that a bit later on Um, so he's quite weedy and he's kind of well to do and she's very sort of meek and it's one of these things that like you know if you know they are violent as at the end of the film and they are violent as a product of the violence that's been inflicted on their daughter and her friend so when I say violence begets violence, that's what I, I mean. So, I mean, David Cronenberg, for example, in A History of Violence, it's quite interesting because he used violence as almost like this contagion type thing where if one person is violent, it then spreads to another person, Yeah, if that makes sense. <clears throat> it's very interesting. Yeah, I think it's correct, really. I would, I would agree that it does spread violence. Um, and without that in films... Um, there would kind of be no, it would go no further, it wouldn't really build up as well, and there would be no sort of dramatic climax of the film like there is in this one. So you kind of have to go there if you want it to be um, something that's, uh, you know, has a huge build up. Um, we, We want them to get revenge, that's what's satisfying. So in this case, yes, violence does beget violence. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the whole point is that they have to be characters that you like, because this is the whole point of rape revenge, is that um, rape revenge in itself, yes, there is a rape carried out against a character and them or someone related to them in some way has to then get revenge on the perpetrators. And if you don't like the people who are getting this revenge, then obviously the film is not going to work very well, which... uh, there might be an example of this that we talk about later on. Um, so um, the first thing that we notice about this film is the way it starts. So it's got, in that typical kind of exploitation way, one of these what I call fake disclaimers at the start. It says, the events you're about to witness are true. Of course they are. Uh, <laughs> names and locations have been changed to protect those individuals still living. So, right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I used to quite like those, you know, years ago. I used to feel like... Um, it made it feel more kind of dramatic to watch the film if you sort of had in the back of your mind that it possibly could be true. So I I used to like that, but obviously we've seen so many of those now 
that is we've gotten to the sort of era where it's not believable because you can look anything you want up on the internet <laughs> well yeah exactly you could, uh, you could get away with lying quite blatantly back in the 1970s unfortunately you can't really get away with that now as you said and yes this is uh, one of those examples i mean we've seen it already earlier in the series about toolbox murders had a very similar sort of disclaimer at some point and i mean texas chainsaw massacre is another one that's probably the most infamous example of like you know the whole fake disclaimer at the start of the film saying like you know these are real events that happen and it's like yes of course they are yeah <laughs> could be based on some kind of you know folklore tale or some kind of rumor or old wives tale or something and then it's been blown massively out of proportion yes so yeah hmm. but yeah it's still a gimmick nonetheless um mm-hmm. So the film starts and yes, we're introduced to Mary, who is one of the girls who gets all these vile acts committed to. We see her in the shower. We see her naked, which admittedly we don't really see in the other versions of this film. So I found that sort of quite interesting that like, "Mm, okay, that's not exploitative or anything like that. Yeah, it's kind of um, to make her out to be this very desirable character because straight away, as soon as the film comes on, you told her full name is Mary Collingwood that she's 17, it's her birthday, the postman's bringing loads of birthday cards, so she's obviously very popular. Yeah. And the, po- the, the mailman says that she's got the prettiest face he's ever seen. Um, and then she's going out to this rock concert, which is, uh, what's the band called? Bloodlust, yeah. And apparently they dismantle live chickens on stage during their act. Um, I found it really funny that he says dismantle, like you just take the pieces apart and then put it back together, you know, like an Ikea furniture pack or something. I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) And it's quite interesting that the mother comments on the fact that she's not wearing a bra. And I thought, (laughs) "Hmm, okay, yeah, because it was obviously the early 70s. So. Oh, that conversation at the beginning was hilarious. I loved it because the the dad says some really inappropriate things and he's like... You can see your nipples plain as day. And then she uses the word tits and he goes, what's this tits business? And then she t- calls her mum a drill sergeant, which is brilliant. And um, she says that back when her mother was younger, they used to tie them up like little lunatics in straight jackets and stuff socks in their bras. <laughs> so <laughs> I found that very entertaining. As soon as the film started with that scene, I thought, yep, I like this film, it's good. <laughs> well done, well done, Wes Craven. <laughs> yeah, you, you were won over straight away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's quite interesting because obviously you've got uh, the parents, I guess, would be from like the 50s generation. So this post-war baby boomer generation, they, you know, typically very presented in films in the 70s anyway. It's very sort of straight laced. And like, yes, they would never ever do sort of these kind of things that the kids in the 70s would get up to. But, you know, hey, that's a historical thing. Yeah, but it's a very 60s film, even though it's 72, it's still very much the kind of 60s era talking about free love and that kind of thing. Absolutely. And then, as you said in the synopsis, um, she has got a friend called Phyllis, who is presented as sort of, I say she's a bit more experienced than Mary is. And uh, she's, you know, very free and easy and she does drugs. And um, I like, (laughs) because... As I said, we're going to talk about the remake at some point. Now, one of the uh, issues I had with the remake, not to kind of spoil that section sort of too much, um, is that in the remake, they show you everything about sort of how Krug and his sort of gang, well, how Krug mainly sort of escapes from prison. Whereas in this, it's just delivered in sort of the laziest sort of exposition ever. It's just like radio. So I love in films like this where there's radio exposition, where it just delivers all this information that you need to know in as quick a way as possible. It's like, yeah, we're going to move on now. (laughs) Yeah. And Krug, who is uh, the main villain in this film, he's played by David Hess, who we're going to talk about a bit later on as well, because he's in another film that we're going to talk about on this show. And he is, in my opinion, of all these different rape revenge films, because there are a few of them, um, not even ones that are with video nasties. There are other sort of rape revenge films around this time as well. I would say he's probably the most memorable kind of person of this type in that he seems to. uh, He's either a very, very good actor or he's genuinely really, really sleazy because you get the feeling he's actually really enjoying what he's doing. Yeah, I think um, um, generally the um, 
uh, it's the convicts, aren't they? The convicts in this film are genuinely intimidating and scary. Like, and they, they've obviously been written as like very kind of crazy characters, so they're very unpredictable. So there's a lot of like weird sort of character introductions at the beginning of them just messing around and doing strange things. It's just very, very sort of out of the ordinary behaviour, like doing an impression of frogs and stuff like that. <laughs> It's very strange, um, but it really does give you that build-up of them being very intimidating, crazy, threatening, unpredictable, and it's great that the because f- um, it's obviously mostly guys, but there's one female, and she is on par with them, um, so they haven't like written her in as like a weaker character, and she's genuinely quite scary as well. Like, I thought they were all fantastic actors. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, what did you think about having a woman in there as part of the gang? Do you think that that made it less sleazy or, I mean, what were your thoughts on that? Because I have an opinion on this. It made it more sleazy um, because of the discussion that they had at the beginning where um, they're all having sex with her and she's like saying she's not going to put out anymore. She's getting sick of it. She wants to be treated uh, better. She wants to have more females with them. Um, um, but she's on the whole, she's kind of okay with that, and it's like normal behavior for them. And she is just as nuts as they are. And I think, like, um, yeah, I think it's a good idea to have that in there because it does make it feel more unsettling that she's kind of on their side. Because it's almost like when there's a female there, um, female can give reassurance to another female that may feel threatened more easily than the men can because they just seem pretty sleazy and psycho like straight from the off but there tends to be this assumption that you could maybe trust them if there's a female there or you could trust the female um because um if they were going to hurt females why would she be with them so there's kind of this conception that it may be okay but then for her to side with them it's like so unsettling and unpredictable and it's unexpected yeah i mean what i would say is that what you have to remember is in the world around this time a couple of years earlier we had had the manson family murders and in that gang there was a woman so i wonder if that they took inspiration from that in that obviously you've got the leader who's very charismatic and you know is the one who in all these kind of rape revenge films, is always the one who kind of tells the others kind of what to do. Um, it's quite interesting, actually. There's uh, all these gangs, for the most part, have the same kind of... Um, the characters are all very similar in that you've got a leader who's normally quite composed most of the time, but has a sadistic side that they keep under wraps that doesn't come out until later. You have one who is openly very sadistic, and then you always have one who's very reluctant, who's kind of doesn't really want to join in, but kind of feels they have to because of peer pressure, or because in this case, the junior character, who is Krug's son, is he's addicted to heroin and his dad's giving him heroin, so he's got this fix. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, and, and yeah, you've got the woman, which I think has said is very similar to the Manson family. Yeah, I'm sure they took a lot of influence from that. Pretty positive about that. Absolutely. Um, now, before we get into kind of the real nasty sort of stuff of, in the film, what did you think about the film itself just overall? Um, it was very uncomfortable to watch. Um, it's, it is very well done. Um, I can see why it's a classic and why it's so well known. Um, And I enjoyed the revenge aspect of it. I thought it had a great finale part of the film. And on the whole, I mean, yeah, I I did um, think that those the characters of the convicts were very well delivered. And I wouldn't say it's, it's a scary film in terms of horror. It's just uncomfortable, which is what it's supposed to be. Yeah, because the whole idea behind rape, and this is something that when we probably go on to our next show where we're talking about this subject, you know, rape is not supposed to be fun. <laughs> this is no. it seems stupid to say. It's not supposed to be a comfortable thing. No. Um, so, yes, when it's happening, obviously there's a line and you don't want it to be too kind of over the top and too sleazy, but it's really not supposed to be an enjoyable thing. I mean, obviously... I've never been raped, so I can't obviously comment 
you know, from my own experience as to what that's like. I'm sure it's absolutely horrible, though. So, yes, rape is not supposed to be fun. So all these kind of films, yes, the whole idea is that this really, really horrific thing happens and then the people who do it, they get what they deserve. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's probably one of the worst crimes imaginable, isn't it? I mean, it, it really is. Um, so, yeah, it's it seems so fitting for it to be very brutally repaid. Um, so after watching something that's very uncomfortable, you should really be rooting for them to get their just desserts. Um, I thought, I thought the music was incredibly good in this film. That was good. Okay. Now, oh, well, I was going to say, um, I was going to talk about the music in a second. What did you think about the overall, like, filmmaking? So the directing, the editing, because one of the things that, I kind of like about this is uh, Craven before he made this film he'd made mainly documentaries and when he made this apparently he made it in this style because it's all that he knew all he knew is how to make documentaries so it does have this very what I've referred to before as like a verite kind of style where it feels like it could actually be happening in front of you it's not that unrealistic it feels very real in the same way the Texas Chainsaw Massacre feels very real because of the way it's been shot yeah, I would agree. I think it it's very fitting and I really liked that delivery. It did make it seem very gritty and very real to me, especially with like I say with those with the main characters. It did seem very realistic. Yeah, no, exactly. They feel like real people. They don't feel like they're acting at all. So, mm. yes, I really enjoyed that aspect. Now, bringing it back to the music which you brought up, I think there's some really great music in this. Um, however, um, there is also some very, very ill-fitting music, I feel, in that you've got certain sections of the film that have what I call jingly-jangly sort of countryfied music that made it sound like I was in Smokey and the Bandit, or I was watching an episode of the Beverly Hillbillies or something like that. It was like... Like something like that. Yeah, that's how how it ends, isn't it? Like Yeah, it ends with the song that you were talking about. Closing credits is to that music, and I found it hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it kind of feels very wrong that you've got these very, very serious, very disturbing things happening in the film, and in other areas of the film, they're offset by this very jaunty music. I'm well, like, hmm. I, d- I just thought maybe that's hinting towards the fact that the comics are quite like hillbilly, redneck, you know, they're maybe that's what <laughs> it's supposed to um, imply. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, because one of the readings of the film is that it's about class, because you talk about nowadays horror being as a lot more class horror. This has got subtext of class, because obviously the criminals, although it's very underplayed in this version, um, they are obviously, like you said, white trash. And, you know, the parents are very well-to-do, like he's a doctor, so obviously he's very wealthy. Clearly he doesn't work on the NHS. Yeah, and the fact that um, one of the sort of quote-unquote redneck characters is a junkie as well that you know adds to it yes um so yeah so overall i mean i found yeah i like the documentary style it's a little bit amateurish i gotta be honest because craven in interviews by his own admission didn't really know what he was doing which is why um you have other elements that i'm going to go into a little bit later on to you know try and offset what was going on so um we have to discuss it so we're going to talk about all the really awful things that happen in this film so right at the start so we've got the two girls um because they want to buy weed they get this weed off of junior and then the other three members of the gang will turn up and they basically take the girls hostage um the friend whose name is phyllis (laughs) which is a very old-fashioned name they don't use anymore um (laughs) she tries to fight back and basically she gets punched in the stomach and I believe she gets raped, although it's not really very clear that that's what happened, but I think that's what happens. Yeah, she gets raped and um, the other girl, um, Mary, she doesn't look that shocked. There's some particularly bad acting in that scene where you don't see the rape, but it's implied and then you just see her reaction and she looks like... Like, maybe she's just opened a surprising birthday gift rather than the fact that her friend is actually <laughs> She could be raped. in shock. 
I'd imagine she could be in shock. That could be, you know, a realistic reaction that, like, you're, you're not prepared for what's going on. You're in this situation. You weren't expecting it. You were expecting to watch this band, you know, rip apart chickens on stage. And instead, you're in this scenario. And it's like, she's only 17, remember? She's very innocent. So I don't know if that's necessarily bad acting. I think it is. <laughs> okay. We'll have to disagree with that one. Um, so <laughs> then at this point we get introduced to, uh, what I referred to in a previous show as the comedy cops. Um, so <laughs> in, uh, don't go in the woods, I referred to sort of cops that made the ones in this film look, uh, competent. Well, they're actually really not that competent. They're actually really fucking inept cops and, they're just, I don't even know why they're in the film, in all honesty. Well, I know why they're in the film. It's because Wes Craven sort of thought that what was happening in the film was too harrowing and he wanted to ops- offset it with this comedy elements where you've got <laughs> these really shit policemen. They're, you know, they don't know what they're doing. Sort of, they their car breaks down because they run out of petrol. I mean, come on, that's not realistic. It's like... <laughs> just forgot to fill the car up it's just another added element of humor for their stupidity yeah and like they have to hitch a ride and you know they try and hitch a ride with these locals and they drive off because they're cops and then in what must be the worst scene in the film they try and hitch a lift on this woman's chicken sort of van or whatever she's got these chickens on top of her like truck (laughs) and like yeah they try and do that and obviously they fall off (laughs) <laughs> it's like it's like uh, it's just very very misplaced sort of slapstick elements i mean i don't know how did you feel about them yeah it's just it is trying to line the mood isn't it but it is very strange and i didn't find it very funny <laughs> no i doubt anyone actually finds it funny apart from in a kind of wry ironic sort of way it's like i can't believe they actually did this kind of way it's like what the fuck um and especially because of kind of where that sort of interspliced in the film. So we've got all these scenes of violence and degradation and rape and like all this horrific stuff. And then, yeah, we've got that afterwards. So And one yeah. of the policemen quite jovi- jovially um, refers to a dead teenager as a kid on ice. And he's like, oh, they haven't found a kid. We haven't had a kid on ice all day today. And he's like, what? And then he's like, wow, that's what they call it at the morgue, a kid on ice. And it's like, <laughs> I just found that absolutely absurd and ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Um, so um, this gang, long story short, they break down. Um, they break down right by where the Collingwoods live, which is a little bit contrived but hey it's fine it works for the story um because in the virgin spring like um there's only one girl and she gets raped and killed just randomly in the woods and the the people who do that they end up at the house of the parents of the girl purely because there are simply no other houses in the area so they're just wandering around they have no they, they could not really end up anywhere else in this it's like well we just happen to have ended up here and Yes, as we mentioned, we got all these various scenes of kind of degradation. So uh, they make one of the girls urinate herself, which uh, uh, is not very pleasant. No, um, I found that one of the most distressing bits, like initially. It's just so humiliating, isn't it? Yeah. And then I don't kind of I, having seen this a few times i'm still not sure entirely what's supposed to be happening here so do they try and make the girls i think at one point they try and make the girls take all their clothes off and hit each other or maybe they want to see them kiss each other i don't really know it's bit, not very uh, pleasant either way a bit of both um yes bit bit of both that's what it seems to be yeah and um at one point uh phyllis tries to escape and she runs away for quite a long time uh, before eventually she gets caught up to and stabbed and killed. And um, she is the first death in the film, if we're treating this as a body count film. Yeah, um, her arm gets cut off, am I right? Uh, yes, it does. It gets cut very much off, yeah. <laughs> so they just produce this arm and then... Um, so it's so Phyllis is the one who dies first, yeah? and then Yeah, so, so, so first let's say we got Phyllis... Mary's screaming when she sees the um, chopped off arm is very, you know, shrill and it's um, very dramatic. Yes, definitely. Um, 
And then what happens is, so yes, so they stab Phyllis to death, essentially. Um, and I liked when she was being stabbed to death. That was one of the points that I did actually like the score that is used in, in the film in that it's got these very weird industrial kind of bleepy noises that I think worked quite well. Yeah, and then when she ran away, they had this music that was something like "Now You're All Alone," which, which was quite sad, and you know. Yeah, so David Hess actually wrote the music in this film, which is uh, is pretty interesting. Uh, David Hess is uh, quite a talented guy in not only is he really good at playing sort of sleazy guys which he does very well um he's also a director so he's actually directed a couple of films one of which is a christmas slasher film believe it or not called to all a good night um Mm -hmm. which is (laughs) that's a cool name yeah yeah it's got a pretty cool name i'm not gonna lie um i've seen it it's not that great, unfortunately. But if you like sort of slasher films with a high body count that are set around Christmas on a campus that aren't Black Christmas, um, because that's obviously the best one, um, then yeah, I uh, you know give it a try. Who knows, oh, you might like it. Sold it to me. You know what kind of films I like. Just that. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> so we have one person who's sold by that. But yeah, anyway, he is... Uh, so yeah, he he is very multi-talented, and as I said, yes, he uh, indeed wrote the music in this film, and yes, that piece of music that you're referring to there is really, really nice and very gentle, and as I said, very offsets kind of what's going on. Yeah, and then, so Mary, eventually, she's freaking out about when she sees the arm of her friend Phyllis, and then they sort of cut her up a lot, like they carve something into her chest, and it's all very uncomfortable to watch and then she tries to run away yeah so he krug carves his name into uh mary's chest and then she gets raped um now (laughs) obviously we're going to be talking about rape quite a bit in these shows so i try not to make light of this too much because obviously rape is not really a, a laughing matter um so but Obviously, for the purpose of this show, I have to compare the rapes and all these different kind of films that we're going to talk about over the next couple of shows. So in this film, um, the rape, you don't obviously see a lot. All you really see is sort of Mary and Krug's face. So as I mentioned, David Hess, he is, I'm going to hope and assume, because obviously David Hess is no longer with us, so I'm not disparaging the dead, in that he looked as if he was acting really well um i did notice all the slobber that was coming out of his mouth when he was uh raping mary um yeah, and, it was yeah, it was very, very convincing it, yeah it was very convincingly done and i thought the close-ups of the face was an excellent way to portray it because you really did believe it without having to see too much and without him needing to actually do that much as an actor like it was all in the facial expressions as you say yes and then the rape, as it always tends to be in these films, it's quite quick. It's not protracted. Um, so it's quick, it's over, and then everyone seems to be in a bit of a daze for a few, for about a minute or so, as in, like, no one can really quite believe what's happened. And then Mary walks off and she walks into a lake, and then she gets shot and she gets killed, and she is, uh, you know, death number two. Yeah, she is. So there are six deaths in total. So our girls are the first two, which I did find quite sort of quick, actually. It did feel quite quick in the film that they were they were both dead. I don't know about you. Yeah, one of the things that I like about the film is actually the pacing. Um, So the pacing of the film um, is very good. It's all very quick because the film is 85 minutes long, which I think is the best length if you're going to make a film like this. You don't want to make it too protracted. Um, So, yeah, you've got basically you've got one thing, then another thing, then another thing, then another thing. And, yeah, it goes at a nice rat-a-tat pace, I would say. Um, So, yeah, so the girls, because they're not really primary characters in the film uh, the film is more about the parents as i said earlier because of their reaction to what's happening and what's going on um so it's more about them um yeah. but yeah they do die pretty much about halfway into the film yeah and so after that um again similar to the virgin spring um the gang basically end up at the collingwood's house um and they don't drag this out too long. But like, they... why the fuck do the parents even let them in? Like, when I watched it, I sort of 
rewound it back and I was like, but why do they why do they let them in? Why do they invite them in? They don't know them. Well, it was a simpler time, Rhea. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like nowadays where you probably wouldn't let a total stranger into your house. The idea is, is that they're good people and like, you know, he's a doctor and, you know, they're hurt. So, you know, he can help them. And, you know, it's <laughs> this is a, another film that we're going to talk about sort of on the next episode. It's this idea of they maybe have good Christian morals. So mm. it's maybe a Christian thing to do, although uh. it's not really explained as such maybe that's an interpretation yeah so they just get dressed up quite smart and then they go to the parents house and the parents let them in and give them dinner i couldn't believe it yes because they don't know what they've done at that point so you know at that point they could just be any random tom dick or harry you know on the street you know it's like my car's broken down can you help me out you know Mm, yeah um and then Luckily, not, it doesn't take them very long to work out who they are, what they've done, um, because Mary has got a necklace that she puts on Brown Junior's neck. Now, um, I've seen different versions of this kind of trope. Obviously, there's the Virgin Spring, there's Night Train Murders, there's the remake of Last House on the Left. Um, I mean, of the kind of versions of this specific film, I think this kind of works the best because junior is a heroin addict he would not necessarily be aware as to what mary's done so yeah he would obviously you know it's not really stupid and contrived like oh he picks it up and puts it on himself or anything like that she puts it on him and then not only does the mother see that she overhears a conversation they're having in the bedroom and also she sees their bloody clothes in the suitcase and yes and they also discover her body by the lake because it's right by their house yeah they run out and they find the body and obviously it's awful but then after that they come back and they take their revenge which is quite entertaining and you know it's uh it it is very well done um i did like the way that they did that that the fact that they realize what they'd done and they're in their house they left them there they went back and they i mean effectively the mum just sort of tries to seduce one of the guys, like flirts with him, whilst the doctor, the father, has gone off to get the shotgun and starts laying down traps, which did get a bit home alone at one point. Yeah, I was going to say that. It is very home alone, especially with the electrocuted doorknob. Oh, God, yeah, and the shaving foam on the floor. I was just like, oh, come on, you're not Macaulay Culkin. Stop it. Just get the (laughs) shotgun. That's enough. It's the second time we brought up Home Alone on this show, by the way. I know, yeah, that's what I thought. Mm, but it is very apt. Yeah, a bit silly. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so Weasel, who is kind of the other guy who's the criminal who's escaped from prison, um, he isn't suspicious by the fact this woman who he's basically just met and he's married and her husband is still in the house is basically coming on to him in their own home um, and then she wants him to go outside and... Um, And yeah, I'll let you take it from here. (laughs) Well, (laughs) she basically says, so she's trying to seduce him so she can kill him. So she lures him into this false sense of security. Husband's gone off to get the gun so he's not there. So she's downstairs having a drink. um, And she basically says, I've always dreamed of a man who can take me easily. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this whole scene made me laugh because he makes some very bold claims. He says that he can, he's like bragging that he can go five or six times. <laughs> and then she's like, well, you said you could do it with your hands tied behind your back. Um, and I'd quite like to see that. And then he goes, yeah, yeah, I can. You should do it. And then she's like, oh, no, no, no. It's just a, ge- a girlish fantasy. I didn't really mean to, you know, tie you up. And he goes, no, no, I can do it. So she ties him up. Um, and then she actually gives him oral sex, which I think is going a little far. Like, we'll discuss this on the next episode as well, like more in depth, but I don't really like it in these revenge films where women actually perform sexual acts in order to then kill the victim. For me, that seems like it's going too far. She could have just, like, stabbed him or something, and she wouldn't have had to have actually... um intimately touched him 
um, which I think is violating themselves. Like if she's doing that with a man who's that repulsive, who's done that to her daughter and he's a criminal and she doesn't want to, you know, give him oral sex. But anyway, this is by the by. What happens is she gives him oral sex and she bites off his penis, which does make for good viewing in the film. It's very dramatic. It's unexpected. But is it really necessary that she needs to perform a sexual act in order to kill him? I don't think so. Um, yeah, I'm not going to really comment on that at this time. I think you've kind of sort of said, you know, your opinion. Um, maybe it's a little bit extreme, but, you know, whatever. It's quite memorable. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, it is, me- it is memorable. That's the point of it, I think. Yeah. It's a little far-fetched. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, hey. Um, and then what you have is obviously they try and then shoot uh, Krug and Sadie, who's the woman in the gang. And basically what happens is that they have a bit of a fight between Krug and the dad and the dad tries to shoot him, etc., etc. And then Junior appears and Junior tries to uh, shoot Krug because he's been mistreating him the whole time and he's been bad mouthing him and saying he's a loser. and he well he says so much sort of negative stuff that junior commits suicide by shooting himself in the head yeah he gets goaded into shooting himself like krug is getting really kind of he's escalating the argument and he's um driving him crazy and eventually shoots himself yep and then (laughs) the doctor then takes it way 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 further than a gun because he gets out a chainsaw and i know how much you love chainsaws so you must have been (laughs) delighted by this i was in my element i'm like yes go on dad get in with the chainsaw <laughs> and that's what he does much better than a shotgun yeah he, and he get he gets him <laughs> it's amazing yes uh, and what we get is um the police who have given up trying to hitchhike have been walking all the way to the collingwood residence they turn up just as uh, dr collingwood is killing krug with his chainsaw which is absolutely well, kind of hilarious in one way or another, but yeah, I, I don't think it's supposed to be hilarious, but I just found it morbidly hilarious because I'm a sick man. So I did find it quite funny as well. It's because their characters, the police throughout, have been very comedic. You kind of, you don't know what to make of it because you don't know if he's actually going to be in trouble and he's there with egg on his face or blood on his chainsaw, so to speak, and they just walk in at that opportune moment. Meanwhile, outside in the garden or the woods, um, the mum is coming back from having bitten off said penis and she r- runs into the uh, <laughs> the female of the gang and there's some kind of knife that's been thrown on the ground, um, I think that the uh, female gang member brought out and she ends up stabbing her. So death number five is the um, Krug with the chainsaw by the dad, and then the mum, meanwhile, is outside stabbing the woman, Um, and then the police show up. So it is very much a dramatic ending to the film, and I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, it's definitely a a very, very explosive ending. Um, And yeah... um... As I said earlier, overall, I, I did enjoy the film. I, In terms of sleaziness, I have to be honest, I actually didn't find it as sleazy as some of the other films we're going to talk about. Although, admittedly, I have seen the film three times now, so maybe it's uh, familiarity with the film that's kind of, you know, dulled my senses to be shocked. Let's put it that way. I think so, because for me, as a first-time watcher, I mean, it doesn't seem excessively like I had to hide my eyes or anything, excessively like gory, dramatic or, you know, brutal, but it's enough where it does um, It does seem very real, like I said. Yeah, I mean, it's not very nice particularly, but I didn't feel it was... So the gang, for example, I didn't think they were overly obnoxious or anything like that. The gang weren't the kind of people who where I didn't want to watch the film because they were too nasty, as in they were sort of over-the-top nasty. Um, They kind of felt realistic, in a way. Yeah, and they were just kind of that little bit unpredictable and crazy enough that you wanted to find out what made them tick because they were so unusual so that kind of kept me engaged because um, their characters almost seemed a little amusing with how kind of different they were 
but in quite a dark way. Yeah. Um, so overall then, would you say that this is a video nasty? Because I have a real kind of, I don't know, I have a bit of a dilemma with this one, um, but I'll let you go first. Ooh, uh, that's a very good point. Um, you don't really see any rape. Um, I'm going to say yes, this is a video nasty, because, uh, mainly because of the, the rape is implied very well. The killing of the girls is um, quite shocking and brutal. Um, the bit where she she wets her pants is very uncomfortable, and the part where the man's penis is bitten off is potentially quite graphic and shocking. So I'm going to say yes, it should be a video nasty. But in terms of the rape scenes, it's not as outwardly shown as I would have thought it would be. Yeah, um, I'm going to say. I mean, even though I have kind of said that, you know, it doesn't really upset me like some of the other films I've seen recently have. Um, I'm going to still say yes, only because it's still pretty uncomfortable. I mean, even the first time I saw it, yes, it was very uncomfortable. The scene where, as you said, Phyllis wets herself. Um, the scene where they're being stabbed. And because it, it's because of the way it's shot, it all looks so realistic as well. It's like, you're, it almost feels in a way like you're watching a snuff movie because it's so realistic. And yeah, I mean, the rape, even though it's not exploitative, you can't really see anything, which is ideal. <laughs> I'm not saying I would want to, but... Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm going to say yes as well. Good, I'm glad we agreed on this. Phew. <laughs> um, although, interestingly, um, on the same subject, um, the film is available uncut. It's got quite, obviously, because the film's so notorious, it does have quite a history with the censors. Um, so it took a long time, but the film is actually available uncut in the UK. It's available from a company called Interfilm, who I've never heard of, but hey, um, they've released this uncut. So if you want to check it out for yourself and you want to buy it on DVD that's the way to do it um, but as I mentioned earlier and I'm quite curious as to your thoughts on this because I have some very strong opinions on this matter um, as I mentioned the film has been remade um, it was remade as part of the uh, lovely torture porn cycle that I referred to on the last show um, in 2009 and it was remade by Dennis Iliardis um, now Ria have you seen the remake of Last House on the Left? Do you know, um, I actually, I'm going to say no, but I may have seen it. It's just that I might have seen it when it came out. So it's been a long time if I have. Okay. Well, essentially I have, I've seen the film. I saw it this week in preparation for this show and I didn't hate it as much as I thought I would. Um, the main issues that I have with this film, um, first of all, really, is that it even exists at all. Because why would you want to remake Last House on the Left? Because Last House on the Left is a product of its time. And, you know, it was very important when it came out. And it's very influential, as we will discuss <laughs> um, later. Well, in fact, the very next film yeah. is very, very, like, you know, heavily, heavily influenced by that. But, you know, at the same time, Yes, it's notorious to people like us, and we've heard of it, but our mainstream audience isn't going to know what Last House on the Left is. Okay, so, I've just done I've just done a bit of research, and I haven't actually seen the remake, so I will endeavour to watch this. But I can see why it's been remade because of the well, the, mainly the reasons that he said like Craven didn't really know what he was doing, so there was potential for it to be remade and to be you know, more brutal and less kind of documentary style because it was very, you know, shot in quite a basic manner. So there was a potential for them to ham this up a lot more, um, especially with those initial, the initial sort of build up where the girls get kidnapped. At first, it is quite sort of like, it doesn't feel like a horror film at first, the way it's shot. So there is that potential to reshoot it in that particular style and to obviously add more modern effects and probably a lot more sort of gritty footage. Okay, I take all that on board and I don't want to get too hung up on this because I don't want to spend too long talking about it. But I have several issues with the film. First of all, it's too long. 
It's nearly two hours long. Uh, the original, as I mentioned earlier, is 85 minutes. That's perfect length. Um, the whole revenge part of the film takes nearly an hour and is ridiculous. Um, the guy who plays the Doctor is too buff. He looks like he could basically really handle himself in a fight, you know, if he needed to. And the whole point is, is that the Doctor in this film is, you know, a quite meek kind of feeble looking guy. So in theory, he shouldn't be used to violence. Um, when people talk about the remake of Last House on the Left, they always say, oh, well, the acting's better and it looks better and it's better made. Well, no fucking shit. Okay, I would hope so. I would hope that a film made 37 years after the original is better made and is better acted. So that's kind of redundant, in my opinion. So, and yes, it does have much better actors. I mean, the guy who plays Krug in the remake is Garrett Dillahunt, and he's been in films that I really like, um, like The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford. That's a great film. And fuck, Aaron Paul is in the remake as one of the gang members. So, you know, obviously it's got much better acting, but it's just, to me, it's just a pointless remake. And I don't want to spoil it for you because you haven't seen it, but one of the deaths, the, the last death in the film, is so stupid. It's so <laughs> fucking stupid that it just made me angry. And it's better than the I Spit in Your Grave remake, um, which isn't saying a lot. But yeah, um, I prefer the original for all its faults. Let's put it that way. I can tell. Let it all out. Let it all out, Greg. Um, I can't comment on it, but I am going to watch it myself. And obviously, filmmakers are going to, filmmaking companies are going to release pointless remakes until the end of time. So we can expect many more. <laughs> well, yes, definitely. Um, so, yeah, so that's Last House on the Left. Um, now, as I mentioned, uh, Last House on the Left was very, very influential particularly in Italy, as uh, any kind of uh, films that do very well in America, especially like low budget sort of exploitation-y kind of films, um, they, the Italians seem to love sort of copycatting whatever is popular, and this is no exception. Um, so the next film that we're going to talk about is Night Train Murders, um, which has many alternative titles, uh, which include Late Night Trains, uh, Last Stop on the Night Train, Don't Ride on Late Night Trains, which anyone who lives in Croydon like I do, I definitely agree with that sentiment <laughs> and yeah. finally and this is very very interesting new house on the left oh, so yeah. yeah you can see what they've done there and this is directed by Aldo Lardo, who is a very talented Italian director who has made a couple of films that I really like. So the first one of which is Short Night of Glass Dolls, which is a very Polanski-esque giallo slash psychological thriller that I very highly recommend. It's got a great score by Ennio Morricone, as indeed does this film. And another mm. giallo called Who Saw Her Die, which is, again is a very good film that I highly recommend. Um, Ooh, I haven't seen these, so I'm going to have to watch them. Yes, so anyone who knows me knows I love my Italian exploitation slash horror. And um, so, yep, I'm totally in my element with the next two films. Um, so, Ria, tell us what happens in The Night Train Murders. Okay, yes, I shall tell you. So, uh, it's a 1975 film and a pair of psychotic hoodlums and an equally demented nymphomaniac woman terrorize two young girls on a train trip from Germany to Italy. So they're, they're going home from, I presume, from studying for the summer. Um, and it, uh, it's going, sorry, not for the summer. It's going, they're going home for Christmas. That's right. From studying. So they're on the train and they're headed back to Italy to stay with the family over Christmas time. Yes. So it's uh, one of the girls is staying with the other girl's family over Christmas. That's the plan. It doesn't happen. <laughs> it's not really a spoiler. Um, yeah. My first comment is that generally on this review, I've got written at the top, grim as fuck. Like, <laughs> that was my review. Uh, I wasn't expecting this to be as brutal as it was, but... It is. Oh, it's it's so uncomfortable to watch. But I would recommend the film on the whole. That I, th I thought it was very worth seeing. Um, it's very realistic. It's very dark. And as I've put across my page, grim as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Again, being very Mancunian. <laughs> yep. It's, uh, it's, it's grim up north. It sure is. Yep. I've been there many times myself. I agree. Um, so... The plot for Last House on the Left basically transpose that to Italy and put it on a train and essentially you've got this film. However, I really like this film. I like it quite a lot actually, despite it being, as Rhea said, grim as fuck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
it's one of those films where you feel like you kind of learn something after you've watched it and it's different and it's very believable as we spoke about about the last film so what did you learn from watching this <sighs> i wouldn't i don't know if i mean like learn something from it it's just when you observe human behavior like that and you've never seen it before it it's kind it kind of feels like a bleak look at humanity that you wouldn't want to experience in the real world so it's almost like um an insight of some of human nature where you can watch it but then you can leave that in the kind of realms of film and not in reality so it's like, it's like a safe way to observe like you almost feel lucky after you've watched this film because you you've seen something so grim that you realize that aspects of everyday life that are so pleasant that it contrasted to that it's like this is just just the worst the worst human behavior you've ever seen yes absolutely um although we're uh, we're still only halfway through the video nasty so far so who knows <laughs> you may so you'll be uh learning more as we go along uh, <laughs> learning okay yes um definitely yikes yikes yeah <laughs> Um, uh, I've got I've got a little quote here from the older female. Um, she actually says, uh, "We're only going to cut her a little." <laughs> yes, that's definitely a, definitely a good quote to take away from this one. Um, so yeah, so as I said, overall, really really big fan of this film. Um, so I really like the way it's shot. Um, yeah, so, I agree. I liked it too. Very nice colours, excellent acting as well. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so during the kind of main kind of grim part of the film, as you said, um, yes, I do really like the way that there's all this blue lighting in the carriage. Um, I think that works really well. And as I mentioned earlier, you've got the Ennio Morricone score um, and Morricone is probably the greatest kind of composer ever. Joel Williams fans may argue, but hey, uh, that's my opinion. Um, so yeah, I just really like the way that the film is put together. It's very stylish in that kind of 70s Italian way that I love so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agree. Um, I did really like the way that this was shot. It, it comes across very well. Uh, it definitely adds to the dynamic of the film um, because um, it, it is beautifully shot, but then it's such an uncomfortable watch at the same time. It's very contrasting. Yes. Um, so you've got two criminals. One's called Blackie and the other one is called Curly. So they sound like they could be dogs. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, did you notice... They're, trying to, they're, they're being very naughty boys and they're trying to get away with not paying their train fare. <laughs> and beating up Santa. Yeah, as well, yeah. That's just a massive hint of what time of the year it is as well. So it just adds to the kind of backstory of the girls coming home for Christmas. Yes. <laughs> Um, now, did you notice that Blackie um, is actually played by uh, is a guy called Flavio Bucci, who is in Suspiria. He plays the blind guy in Suspiria. Yeah, I did realise that I'd seen him before, but I couldn't quite place what it was. Yeah, so it's a very, very different character in this one. Um, now, yes, as I said, the plot is very, very similar to Last House on the Left, in that you've got two girls, one of whom is more experienced, shall we say, um, than the other one. And one is still a virgin, which does lead to a very, very grim moment that happens later on. And oh, let's call that deflowering because that's how a lady on the train put it. Yes. Um, but what you have is you have this very interesting dynamic with the kind of gang because it's only two guys. And then you have this very, very mysterious woman on the train. That's literally all she's called in the credits. She doesn't have a name. Um, who is played by Maca Merrill, who is most famous for playing the psychic in Dario Argento's Profondo Rosso, right at the beginning of that film. Um, mm -hmm. Very, very, very interesting character. I mean, so whereas in Last House on the Left, you had the woman is this very sort of unstable kind of underling character who is probably mm -hmm. passed around between the two guys. In this one... It's very, very morally ambiguous, kind of mm -hmm. what is her motivation for doing all this. Yeah, I mean, this. I think this is what I liked about the film so much. I was so surprised by this. I did not see this coming. It's very, very clever and very unexpected and different. Um, so this woman is essentially a nympho, but 
when you see her, she's so well dressed. She's a mature woman. It's a total curveball for thrown in there. Like you do not expect this. She fancies one of those hoodlum criminal guys, and uh, she ends up in the toilet um, where he's hiding because he doesn't want to pay his train fare. She ends up locked in the toilet with him at the same time because she goes in there to use it, and he's hiding out. And um, at first, she's he starts touching her because he quite fancies her, or he just decides that he wants to uh, get it on. And um, she's like, "Oh no!" And then suddenly, she just kind of switches just like that, and she's like, "Oh yeah, all right then." And obviously, they get carried away in the toilets, but she like starts to sort of lead that. So it's not like he doesn't like rape her or anything. She completely encourages it. She takes the lead with it, even. And so they have sex in the toilets. And then from there on in, she sides with them. And like you say about the motivation, it's, it's unclear, but, um, she just seems to have been empowered by this whole experience. And it, at first it seems like it's out of character, but you don't know enough about her to know if that is out of character. And the unsettling thing about this film, it's like I mentioned with, um, last house on the left is that the, there is this dynamic that with a female presence especially somebody who looks like she's again coming back to the class situation that we talked about she seems to be well dressed so probably middle class she's a mature woman um instantly your brain goes to that place where you should be able to trust her and perhaps trust the men that she's with because she's there. So because of the female presence, because of her class, because of the way she's dressed and the way she comes across, she should be trustworthy. But she is exactly the opposite of what you would think in this film. And she's just as evil as they are, if not possibly worse at some points, which is something that I noticed in Last House on the left as well. Definite equality of sexes, but in terms of... Um, just on a level of them being so dark and disturbed, <laughs> which isn't the kind of equality that you want <laughs> in the world. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And yes, it's quite interesting that like when she has sex in the toilet um, with Blackie is that at first it's like she doesn't want it. And then halfway through, she kind of switches, which is the it comes from straw dogs. So it's a little bit sort of, Again, it's a bit morally dubious because it's like, well, she's kind of being raped, but is she really being raped? Does she kind of enjoy it? So, yeah. No, she's kind of not being raped, though, because she kind of encourages it, and it's quite soon that she encourages it. So definitely not being raped, but it does seem to trigger something in her personality, personality that after that... It, the whole film just takes a dark twist but like I say she looks like a trustworthy person and it's almost like he's just brought that out of her personality and then after that she's just like unstoppably um, disgusting and bleak with her behaviour well you know well dressed well spoken sort of upper middle class women they can be very very dirty <laughs> so you know <laughs> yeah, alright then not going to question uh your evidence behind that let's move on <laughs> yes um so let's move on as i said in the previous sort of review um let's move on to the uh the grim as fuck bit as you uh so lovelily termed it um so the five main characters um they are on a busy train to start off with and i was thinking well how are they going to rape these girls and do all this stuff because they're on a really busy train with all these people on it so it's not going to really make any sense um but then but they... no 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 what you don't realize is it's like harry potter train where they've got these little secluded carriages where you can shut the door <laughs> well yeah so what happens is they move on to a different train which is basically deserted by like one or two people and then, um, yeah, and then basically everything kind of starts from there. So essentially, it's really very, very bizarre because, yeah, you've got this woman who's really telling these guys sort of what to do. She's the one telling them to do all these really horrible things to these girls. Like, for example, um, yeah, gets one of them to basically take her panties off. Um, one of them sort of starts having sex with like some random guy who is a peeping tom this older guy 
And mm-hmm. that kind of goes very, very dark later on because what happens is, just to kind of fast forward a little bit, is that he kind of has sex with one of the girls and then he leaves and gets off the train. And then the next day, once it's out on the news that like both of these girls are dead, then he phones the police and says, oh yeah, I know who did it. It's these people. <laughs> so it's like... Very, very, very morally ambiguous, as I've said probably about 30 Mm. times now on this episode. Yeah, and I mean, even the way that Lady on the Train starts with her kind of um, deviances, she makes the girls watch them perform in some kind of sexual act. You don't really see because it's very dark in the carriage. Um, But that's the way that she starts the ball rolling, so to speak. And then then obviously after that, um, they do all sorts... Um, and particularly uncomfortable part of the film was where one of the guys tries to rape the girl and she's asked her if she's a virgin and she doesn't want to talk about it. But it's obvious that she is and she, that she's terrified. And then he remarks something like, oh, um, I can't do it, she's too tight or something. It's just horrible. It's really, really sick. It made me feel re- really sick to watch it. Um, and so then she has this solution to it where they take a scalpel and they're going to cut her down below to like make it easier for him. And it, uh, it's just horrific. And then she starts like, you don't really see what's going on, but you just see a lot of blood from her skirt. Um, it's so uncomfortable. And then they go too far with it. She ends up dying. But then the worst thing is that the, um, lady on the train, well dressed lady, She's sort of like in shock or disbelief that the girl has passed away. Like she just thinks it's a very trivial thing that they've done. And she starts slapping her and saying, stop pretending. She doesn't believe that she's died. So she's just there slapping this dead body. And then they're trying to sort of hide the evidence. So it just all gets very quickly out of hand. And like you say, with the peeping Tom at the door who comes in and then later reports them, it's just like their morals don't exist at all. It's seriously uncomfortable to watch (laughs) yeah so i think one of the main themes of this uh film and in italian exploitation cinema they essentially take what italian art house cinema is doing and they kind of take some of the themes from that but obviously in a more exploitative way so whereas a lot of characters in this film and indeed the next film we're going to talk about look as if they could be taken straight from uh, antonioni or a fellini film and they've been transplanted into this film um basically the whole idea is in my opinion it's the idea of the rich taking advantage of the working class so in this case you've got this woman who's clearly meant to be very, very well-to-do, quite well-off, and she looks nice, as you said. And, you know, she's taking advantage of these sort of poor guys who are having to steal, basically, and getting them to basically fulfil her kicks, so to speak. Her dirty sort of whatever it is that she's a fantasy or something. So, yeah, it's a lot of that going on. And then, well, spoiler, and then she blames it all on them at the end and bloody well gets away with it because she's so well-dressed and apparently so trustworthy looking. So that just says a lot about class and the, you know, the kind of implications of this film um, is that she she carried it off very well. You know, you wouldn't have believed that she would be capable of the things that she was doing. It was It's just horrific. Yeah, so she's got the veil. So you notice when she's got the veil up, she's obviously revealing like her true self. And when she wants to look respectable, she puts the veil down again. Yeah, it's almost like a mask that she hides behind as well, isn't it? It's almost like, you know, if somebody puts sunglasses on so you don't make direct eye contact with them because they feel bad or something like that. It's like that. It's like she's kind of averting the like direct eye contact because she might feel guilty about what she's done. Yes, absolutely. And um, so Lisa, who is the girl who got stabbed between the legs, let's put it that way, um, she dies. And then Margaret, who's her friend, um, tries to escape the train um, by jumping out the window, which is uh, not a good idea. (laughs) 
At, at first, I thought she might survive that, but it's just awful. Like, again, the train is travelling at full speed. She sees it as a better solution to hang out of the train window and jump on the off chance that she might survive rather than stay there with them and get raped and killed. So that's that. those are her choices, and she chooses to jump out the window, and, of course, she dies. Um, you can tell she's not survived, and it's pretty horrific. Um, and then they realise that they've got this dead girl that they're slapping um, with all the blood everywhere and the evidence and they start to panic. So and at this point, I actually made myself laugh a little bit. I think it's because it's so grim and I was in kind of in shock a bit. But they pick her up as though she's kind of light as a feather. Cause she's, I mean, she's only a young girl. Um, but at first I thought they were going to put her in the overhead storage compartment the way they do it. But then they throw her out the window and I was just so shocked. <laughs> like I really thought they were going to stash her away like and hide her on the train but then they they actually do throw her out the window it's very sudden you couldn't do that on trains in this country no you couldn't definitely not you're right yeah <laughs> um so one of the things I like just before we kind of get to like the revenge part of the film um there's a scene so it takes place sort of just before all this violence kind of happens is there's a scene which uses Morricone's music very well in that Curly is playing a harmonica and that kind of blends into the score and then you've got this long sort of scene at the start where you've got the woman and you've got Blackie and you've got Curly and the two girls sort of in this room with this blue lighting and you've got this really awesome music playing with the harmonica mm. and I mean that kind of reminded me of this you know Morricone has done this before in Once Upon a Time in the West um, with Charles mm. Bronson's character in that film so I really like sort of you know that's another thing I really liked. Yeah I also found that a very successful scene very well done and almost felt that the harmonica it was very bluesy so it did like go suit the mood very well but i do feel like that the harmonica thing it's more like a sort of traveling man it's more like a class thing as well like that's not a middle class thing to portray in the film at all that's more of a working class thing to do or somebody who's like um like i say a traveler or vagrant or something like that somebody who doesn't stay in one place that's what the mood that comes across so it does suit it very well and gives that contrast of the um, middle-aged train woman who's well dressed and him who is quite the opposite really yeah absolutely um and then yeah because you need the revenge part you get the revenge part so as you've kind of said already um curly and blackie are both killed by the parents yeah because uh, what well, how they get tipped off in this one is um, that Lisa, for, because it's Christmas, she's buying a Christmas present, she buys her dad a really shit tie um, <laughs> that Curly then decides to wear for some reason that he puts on himself and he's just wearing it. And then the mother notices that he's wearing this tie that, you know, Lisa was going to buy like, her dad. So It was like, I presume it's from, it seems like it's from the German Christmas markets, which is quite a sort of nice thing to do for Christmas but also it seems like it's like a silk brightly coloured cravat so I think it's considered like sort of a classy thing that you would probably only wear like as a sort of more refined gentleman but admittedly it does not suit that guy <laughs> when he puts it with what he's wearing it's not the kind of thing that you put with your casual everyday uh, t-shirt and jeans look. Yes absolutely and um Curly, because he's a drug addict, and similarly to Last House on the Left, um, the dad is a doctor, so he has all this medication in his house, which is very, very big, I have to say. Um, yeah, she she does comment that they've got like five or six bathrooms, doesn't she, at one point? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And essentially, Curly gets beaten absolutely to death, it, but it takes about three or four minutes for him to get beaten to death, and then Blackie gets shot with a shotgun at very close range. Um, but yeah, the woman gets away with it. So this woman on the train, she kind of, well, the dad kind of suspects that she has something to do with it, but we don't know if she gets away with it because it ends just as the police are kind of turning up. So you've got this kind of, you know, you don't know whether she's going to get away with it or not. So who knows? Yeah, in my mind, she had convinced them and she'd got away with it because she was still there. 
Um, but yeah, as as we say, there are four deaths in this film. The two girls initially, the two men shot by the father at the end, the woman surviving because seemingly she's managed to persuade them that she she tells them that they're drug addicts, that she's not, and that they threatened to kill her if she didn't partake. So I think she's going to get away with it, and I think it's a very clever twist, and was very outrageous, and just kept me glued to the film all the way through. So I would recommend this film, although it is, as I say, grim as fuck. It's brutal. Yes. So <laughs> from that, I can probably guess that you uh, think this sh- should be a video nasty, then. Absolutely. And like the girl seems so vulnerable and young and just talking about her virginity and I think I've got the quote written down here actually of what he says which will give you an idea of how horrible it is just let me find it so he say like when he when he rapes her he says oh I I can't do this she's as tight as a frightened arsehole and it just made me want to vomit. It's just so disgusting and she's so frightened. And when they cut her with the scalpel, it's literally just horrific. Can't think of anything worse. Um, it, not only is it humiliating, but she's in such a lot of pain as well. So I'm definitely going to say that this should have been banned at the time. It's shocking. It's horrific. But on the whole, it is a very good um, representation of some of the grimmest behaviour in humanity. And I think it's worth a watch. Yeah, um, I also agree that it's a video nasty um, for that one scene really alone um, because it's the worst scene in the film by far. Um, However, the film is now available on cut and it's available from 88 films on both Blu-ray and DVD, although previously it was actually available from Shameless, which is quite interesting. Um, And I should know because I actually own it on DVD from 88 so uh yes i'm a proud owner of this film um and of the films that we've talked about in this series it's actually one of probably my favorites so far oh okay cool excellent well i'm glad that i watched this for the show because i'd actually never never heard of it before this so yes and as i said you know i do recommend lardo's two other films that i mentioned quite highly so uh, anyone who wants to check those out or indeed check this one out um please do because i say they're very well made films um even if this one is grim as fuck as we said <laughs> okay so that leaves us with one more for our usual three film review for the video nasties episode Yes, and this one is pretty grim as fuck as well, I've got to say. Um, So this is another Italian exploitation film. Um, So this is House on the Edge of the Park, um, directed by Ruggiero Diodato, who we previously, on episode number two, reviewed Cannibal Holocaust. This is his other video nasty. Um, So, Ria, what happens in House on the Edge of the Park? Oh Well, I've been looking forward to this one, actually, because um, I knew it had been on the cards for a while. So, And I, I, for some reason, I had good expectations of this film. So the synopsis is, and it's a 1980 film, two low-life punks invite themselves to a party at a posh house. And after being taunted by the snobbish host, they hold everybody hostage and subject themselves, subject the guests to various forms of torture and mayhem. Yes. Now, this is our second appearance on the show of David Hess. So, obviously, he was Krug in Last House on the Left. And because, you know, it was a very popular film in Italy, uh, David Hess got a lot of work in Italy. So, not only was he in this Italian film, um, he was also in a film called Hitchhike with uh, Franco Nero, which is kind of he's playing a kind of similar character although it's less sleazy than the films that we're talking about on this show it's actually quite a good film it's sort of one of these sort of people on the road where they pick up a hitchhiker and then the hitchhiker kind of takes the people in the car hostage that kind of film but it's not as sleazy as that sounds considering it's david hess so it's quite a good film i recommend that one and he was in another film for diodato called body count which is a slasher film which is okay it's not that great but yeah Yep, so of the two Diodata films that he appears in, this is the best one. Um, And body count wise, I'm going to spoil it, there's only two deaths in the whole film, so it's not really a body count film. Um, But yeah, so Ria, what did you think of this film overall? Um, Yeah, I actually, I enjoyed this. I thought it was was great. I thought it's got a great twist at the end. Um, It starts off very dramatically, so... um, Alex, the main character, who's a psychotic mechanic, he rapes a woman in the park 
and then the whole going to the party and sort of the difference in in class thing because we very much have this sort of um this sort of class um trend cropping up in a lot of horror films at the moment like i think we we discussed it with um Rob Zombie's 31 as well where you have like these mansions and posh houses and how the sort of well to do and how the other half live contrasts with the working class or kind of redneck vibe and how they tend to be the ones that are the deviants that are like torturing or doing the killing and that's been very much reversed lately where they've had um, upper class killing working class for enjoyment and such things like that so you still got that contrast of class in this film um but yeah on the whole i thought this was very surprisingly good um it's got a fantastic ending that i enjoyed and i thought it was a good watch i'd recommend it okay um i actually found this quite enjoyable as well which is weird considering what happens in the film so um yeah so as you said there's a rape that takes place right at the start of the film although it's not protracted as such again um so there is strangulation involved as well so that was a little bit like "Mm, okay that's a little bit upsetting but it doesn't take a long time and it does cut away it cuts to black during it every so often so yeah it's and it doesn't take very long so that was you know that was fine and then yeah we introduced to alex and ricky so it's quite interesting in that it's not a gang it's two guys alex is obviously the more confident one he's played by david hess and ricky is kind of a bit more simple and a bit more naive and he's played by giovanni lombardo radice who Mm -hmm. uh, we've previously talked about in cannibal apocalypse and cannibal ferox um and yeah he's always good in whatever film he's in and this is no exception so he kind of you know allows himself to be taken advantage of by these rich characters who are in this house um who i gotta be honest like the only thing i would say and i don't know if this is necessarily a valid criticism is is there really any likable characters in the film um no i didn't particularly like the characters at the party in the film um so it was almost like I wasn't really bothered that they were getting terrorised. I, I, I kind of felt there was more intrigue behind the the two guys who were actually doing it. Like, they had stronger characters, and the guests at the party, I guess we're not supposed to really care about that much because it was all a bit wishy-washy. It's quite cool that it's, it's obviously set in New York. There's some quite cool music, some funky disco music going <laughs> on very 70s um the people at the house are very lavishly dressed which is quite interesting because they've all got kind of quite a unique look and it it's um the so the costuming is quite well done for that but in terms of character apart from what they look like you don't really get much of that coming across yeah so to be honest like all the characters at the house anyway so if we ignore alex and ricky for a second they're all kind of rich and they're really not very nice in fact i don't know to be honest some of them i just wasn't really sure what their motivation were so the main guy whose house it is whose name's tom who is played by a christian borromeo who is in dario gento's tenebrae which is a video nasty which we're going to cover at some point um so him and his girlfriend i believe it's supposed to be his girlfriend who's called lisa um they act very weirdly really they don't act it almost feels like i don't know do you think this is <laughs> it's gonna sound like a really stupid thing to ask but do you almost feel like the way these people acted is in no way realistic whatsoever um yeah kind of i i, I think I would imagine they were chosen on their looks because they all had they all had quite specific looks and they all looked like models. So maybe they were chosen for that just to be sort of striking looking and to pull off the the outfit. And they weren't really supposed to be doing much in it apart from being terrorised. So it, it it does feel like they're not that convincing. Um, it's and it, it after you've seen the film, it's difficult to remember like like what they do or say even um, but i can picture the two guys that are terrorizing everybody quite well but but the other characters just don't stand out that much yeah so this is a a bit of a curious film i've got to say because plot wise not really a lot happens if you think about it so there's the rape 
And then you've got the circumstances, which are very strange, um, that lead to Alex and Ricky ending up at this party. And then what you have is you have essentially, they kind of take advantage of Ricky. So they make him dance, which is hilarious, I have to say. Uh, to that lovely mm-hmm. disco song. So the music in this film is actually done by Rizal Talani, who also did the, uh, the very famous score from Cannibal Holocaust. Um, and- initially, there's a lot of excuses for boobs and obligatory shower scene and stuff like that as well. So I do feel like those characters at the party have been entirely based on how they look. <laughs> yeah, so the Lisa character in particular does get naked quite a lot, which isn't a bad thing. She's a very attractive woman. But again, it's like, well, what's actually going on here? Because this guy, Alex, is clearly, I mean, it's David Hess. He's a sleazy motherfucker. So Mm. clearly he's there for one thing and one thing only. And it just, I don't know. I don't know if the bourgeois are sort of very like, you know, oh, it doesn't matter that you're going out with someone. You can just have sex with my girlfriend. Yeah, I don't mind. It's fine. Um, So Mm. I don't know. I just found that very strange. And yes, there's a scene where her and Alex have sex and... Again, it's kind of ambiguous as to whether or not, well, is she enjoying it? Is this rape? Is this forced? Or is this, you know, coerced? Or I don't know. That was very, very odd. That was very odd. It was like he forced it, but then she was enjoying it. It was very ambiguous. I didn't understand that part, which was a little disturbing. But it does seem like on the whole that she consents to it. So it doesn't makes it seem not as bad. But I didn't think that that was supposed to be in the film like that's not supposed to be the way that they planned it so why would they put it in there like that it's very strange um so there's a few kind of incidents in the film that i think are quite memorable so there's a poker game uh where again they're cheating and they're trying to basically embarrass ricky and then uh alex basically spots that this is going on and essentially beats up the guys quite badly um there's a scene where alex sort of takes tom's head and bangs it into you know a poker table over and over and over again which is pretty violent um there's oh a scene- yeah he calls him a faggot a lot which is yes. just horrible yeah. yeah and um there's another guy at the party called howard <laughs> um where he sort of takes him beats him up uh throws him into a swimming pool and urinates on him oh god yeah and then but they they start all of this off by saying now we're going to have some fun with these cunts and you know, <laughs> using the C word. And at one point he says, um, he starts shouting at them and he says, you heard me, you twat. But it's like pronounced really funny. So that made me laugh because we, we say twat where I come from. So <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was quite funny. <laughs> yes. I, I also say twat. So, but yeah, it's this weird <laughs> thing in Italian films that they say twat. Like the ways that Americans would say it, so yeah. Well, it's like it's got two A's in there, which is found very amusing. What? Um, so, and then there's that. I mean, we've had this line in a horror film before that I found very funny as well. But there's one part where one of the uh, where Alex says "shit" or "get off the pot," and it's like, how many films are they using this in at the time? It must have been like on trend. Yes. <laughs> Very, very popular amongst Italian screenwriters in 1980, clearly. <laughs> exactly. I'm trying to remember what film that was that it was last time, but it was about quite near the beginning of when that we started. Was, uh, that podcast. was Cannibal Apocalypse. Oh, very well remembered. Thank you. Uh, sorry. We refer you to our previous episode if you want to listen to that one. <laughs> yes, uh, it's episode number two. Uh, yes, it's John Saxon's character in the Cannibal Apocalypse that says that. Uh, <laughs> you are an endless horror encyclopedia, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so, well, it's got to be good for something. It works very well for this show. It doesn't necessarily work in my everyday life, but hey, never mind. Um... <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I give you Greg Knox, everybody. <laughs> anyway, moving swiftly as far away from my personal life as possible. Um, so basically... <laughs> two deaths, a- two deaths. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, well, what I was going to say is, um, so as well as that, there's another kind of series of incidents that involve Ricky and a character called Gloria. Now, Gloria is played by, and it's a Cannibal Ferox kind of reunion as such, because she's played by Lorraine DeSalle who was the main character in Cannibal Ferox. And she is kind of, again, very... I don't know if this is a comment on the bourgeois, but essentially 
again, she is kind of... What happens is that Ricky tries to rape at Alex's sort of insistence this character, Gloria, and he can't do it because she doesn't want it, essentially, which is fair enough. And what happens is that she tries to escape and then Ricky goes after her and then they have consensual sex outside, which is... Again, like, it, I kind of thought, well, she's just doing this to kind of lure him into a full sense of security and then she's going to hit him and then run away. But that doesn't happen. So, again, yeah. very curious. Very weird. It's almost like she just liked him. I think, does he not compliment her before that? And he says he doesn't want to rape her because she's special or something. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he is the closest thing we have to a good character in the film in the sense that he you know, doesn't really want to take part in what's going on. He's a bit simple. And yeah, so he doesn't really want to do bad things to her, but then she lets him have sex with her anyway, which is nice. And it's like she almost found that endearing and then she, you know, that then they go off and they and she has it away with him. <laughs> yes. Although after it's very this... very strange. Yeah, although after this, what happens is we get kind of the most troubling aspect of the film, and it's troubling because, I mean, this is not even necessarily my opinion, um, the the BBFC kind of have this opinion, because um, just to kind of get this out of the way right now, the film is available on DVD in the UK, it's available from Shameless, but it's cut by 48 seconds. And the reason it's cut by 48 seconds is because there's a character who appears later on in the film um, called Cindy, who essentially Alex kind of runs a razor up and down her naked body, which I don't Mm. think they like that. But worse is he actually starts cutting her naked body with the razor over and over and over and over again. So I'm like, okay, I can see why the BBFC didn't like this. I mean, I don't personally have a problem with that, but, you know... Yeah, well, They're she's fully me, naked. So. She's fully naked, and she looks very young and naive and frightened, and it is very unsettling to watch. Um, and it's very um, uh, what do you call it? Well, she looks very innocent, doesn't she? So you know, and she is a virgin, which is very weird. So she turns up. She's a virgin. You know, he runs this razor down her body, um, and then he starts cutting her. And it's interesting because. Um, yeah, you don't really see. I thought she was going to get raped, but she doesn't. But it is very yeah. uncomfortable to watch, and it's very degrading. Um, yeah, and she does look very innocent, and it's it probably is the the worst part of the film. Yeah. Now we kind of come to the end of the film. Now you said you liked the ending. Now I've actually seen this film twice, and the first time that I watched the film. I thought, okay, that's kind of a cool ending. So, spoiler alert, um, what happens is that essentially this whole thing, so, you know, Tom and Lisa sort of pick up Alex and Ricky. um, They pretend that that their car has a problem with it as an excuse to kind of talk to them and go to take them to their house. And it's basically, because this is a rape revenge film, it's the longest, most protracted revenge in rape revenge film history. It's ridiculous. So essentially... Hmm. The person who got raped at the start of the film is Tom's sister. So basically, it's him getting revenge on Alex for raping and killing his sister. But yeah. really, it makes absolutely no sense. It does, though. I just thought that was a really clever twist because they like led him there. And then, I mean, they might not have realised that they would they would have terrorised him all, but obviously they know what kind of person he is and that they're quite dangerous characters. So that all happened. And then at the end, he just gets the gun out and does what they were going to do all along. Because I think they started off by teasing this Ricky, the sort of um, mentally challenged guy, um, teasing this guy and they didn't expect that it was going to get so out of hand when he said like we're going to have some fun with these CUNTs and um, <laughs> see you next Tuesdays uh, yeah these see you next Tuesdays um, so all that kind of happened so it all got out of hand and it, it turned back on them I think they probably thought they could handle it a lot better than they did but obviously it went quite far and then in the end 
um, he gets his gun and he shoots him in the dick. So <laughs> I was like, quite do. impressed. I was quite impressed with this because not only did he shoot him there, and it's very dramatic, and it's like brilliant way to end it, but. It's like the weakest character that does it and his motivation is excellent. And I'd kind of just thought that that was building the character of how terrible the two guys were. I didn't think that that was the explanation for why they were at the party. So it all ties in very well. I thought it was an excellent twist and I thought it was a great film. Um, Not a great title, but I think this is, again, a trendy thing that was around in the 80s and that's the, why they named it House on the Edge of the Park. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the issue I have with the ending is more, I mean, it is kind of a clever twist. However, realistically, you know, you've put all these poor women through all this ordeal. So you've got your girlfriend who's had sex with the guy, um, you know, this woman, Gloria, who, you know, kind of been, you know, harassed and sort of put through trauma. There's a black woman there. She's kind of put through trauma as well although not quite as bad and this poor girl cindy i mean she's got cut to absolute shit with a razor blade and in theory if you wanted to shoot the guy why didn't you just shoot him earlier it doesn't really make sense to me but you know i didn't that you know that is very true that is very true it's very long and drawn out and it it shouldn't have gone that far but yeah, I mean, that's that's the premise of the film. So it was surprising, and I still think it's a, a decent film. I think this could be remade, actually. Oh, God, I wouldn't want to try and remake this. Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, oh, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm not saying that, like, you know, you couldn't make a good remake of this, but it's like, how would you get around all the sexual violence? I know, yeah. Well, it, it would be pretty grim, but I think it'll probably get remade at some point, but with a different name. Um, there's one quite clever bit when, which shows Alex's character very well when he's kind of taunting them and teasing them near the beginning and he, he comments to one of the girls, he says, along came a spider and sat down beside her and scared the living shit out of her, <laughs> which I thought was really funny. Um, uh, and he, he says to Ricky, or Ricky says to him, and I'm not sure actually, keep those rich assholes under control and things like that and it, I, I just think it's done very well where he he kind of has that dark part of his character coming out there with the things that he's saying to them and he just plays that part so well so this is that's why it's such an interesting film and without all those terrible things happening at the party there wouldn't be that film so there's your explanation for why it's so long and drawn out yeah, I suppose, I mean, look, don't get me wrong, like, um, if horror films were realistic, a lot of the time it'd only last about 10 minutes. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I get that. You know, if this was realistic, then, you know, he'd have just called the police and then Alex would have been arrested and we'd have had no film. Or he would have shot him literally within about five minutes of them arriving. So the film would have been 20 minutes long. Um, but yeah. Exactly. And there's some quite creepy music in this film. So there's that Sweetly song that comes on at the end. And um, when Cindy's there, the Sweetly song's on again, I think. And it's, it is, um, like, the music's pretty creepy. So that adds to it. And uh, in the end, he bleeds out in the pool. So that's two deaths, the sister. And then they get him back for killing the sister. So all's well that ends well. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I enjoyed the film. It's a very brisk watch. Um, I, you know, it wasn't boring at any point. I mean, I did say it doesn't really have much of a plot. Nothing really happens. But, I mean, David Hess in and of himself is kind of un... He's kind of unhinged and kind of almost like allowed to do basically whatever he wants, which I think is quite cool, really, in my opinion. Um, And, well, moving on to the obvious kind of subject, um, I'm going to say, considering that it's cut, so it's not even available uncut in the UK right now. I'm going to say that, yes, this is in fact a video nasty. Yes, I agree. Um, did not enjoy seeing a young, naive, virginal girl naked being treated that way. It was so horrible. So, yes, I would definitely say this should have been banned. Cool. So this is three video nasties all in the same episode. So, yeah, these are the controversial ones that, you know, you want to get to if you want to watch, like, the hardest of the hardcore kind of shit. Um, 
So yeah, although I've got to be honest, all three films are actually really good on this show. So which of the three, which one would you actually say is your favourite? Because this is quite curious. We actually enjoyed all of them. Yeah, um, I think Last House on the left because it's more of a classic one, but it's quite close with House on the Edge of the Park. And I enjoyed all three, like I say. And um, yeah, we are very much at the the gritty watches at the moment. So having watched a lot of these Rape Revenge films in one week, I um, question what my dreams are going to be like. Because when we did the Hellraiser marathon and I watched nine Hellraiser movies like in one week, I had lots of dreams about snapped ankles. I don't know if I told you that. Yes, (laughs) I do remember you saying, yeah. Yeah, let's see what my dreams are like tonight. Hopefully not as bad as that. (laughs) No, let's hope not. And on that note, um, we're going to call it a day. So I hope you've enjoyed the show. My name's Greg Knox. And I really, really hope that you guys, if you've not already, that you're following us on Facebook, on our Facebook page, The Lament Configuration, on Twitter, at Lament Horror, um, and that you subscribe to us on iTunes and you've rated and given us five stars because, you know, hey, I want to get this out to as many people as possible. And, you know, if you don't have iTunes, you can obviously subscribe to us on YouTube, on our dedicated YouTube channel where I post up all the shows and maybe looking to add some exclusive content to youtube at some point or indeed on podbean or on tune in radio i've been Rhea Fend, and thank you again for tuning in from me um keep on tuning in because we're already planning our halloween material and it's going to be getting very awesome towards halloween favorite part of the year obviously above christmas so as i say i've been Rhea Fend, alternative model and budding actress you can find me on Facebook under reoffend. Uh, I actually this week just reached 40,000 followers on Facebook, so feels like a bit of a milestone. Thanks for following me on there. I'm also on Instagram as at rea underscore fend and on Twitter as well. Um, keep on tuning in and we'll be back next time for more rape revenge films. I was thinking, is that revenge of the rape revenge films if it's the sequel? <laughs> yes indeed um by the way i think i have 40 followers on facebook or friends um so yeah so it kind of just shows <laughs> um but anyway um so yeah as Rhea said um more rape revenge films to come including a very very well known one um so i look forward to talking about that i guess I'm not really sure that that's really sort of the right thing to say but it's been a lot of fun discussing these very very horrible films i look forward to doing the show on the next show so thank you very much and i wish you a very good day toodles